long day. I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow. And I am Father Matthew Cowd. And we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by Tan Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air. Where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. It makes me How are you? I am well. Welcome back. Good to see you. Well, likewise. You know, I tried to get together with you to do another recording before Thanksgiving, but you were just too busy. I wasn't really. I don't remember being too busy because oh. I don't use that word anymore. Oh. It's my new thing. I'm not busy. My days are full. <laughs> my days are full. Because everyone says that they're busy, ultimately, mm-hmm. right? And everyone has exactly the same amount of time. Uh, in 24 hours in a day and so we choose what we do and sometimes our jobs and our responsibilities choose for us to be sure but nevertheless I'm trying to be very intentional about having a full day um, that such that I could lay my head on the pillow at night and feel like I was responsible to the Lord but at the same time it wasn't just busy. Well our dozens of fans <laughs> were wondering why there was such a delay and I wanted to virtue signal that it wasn't me. Okay. And then well, it was you. I'm not so sure because I, if I recall, you couldn't come out. And I could I could come out, but then you weren't there. Uh, but be that as it may, um, I have to say I, I, I got feet. the same response for, even from my family. So my wonderful grandmother, who's 91 years old, Aww. asked me when we were making she does not another recording. Look oh my 91. gosh, she looks like she's like, extraordinary. I don't know. It's extraordinary. It's, it's, I don't think I got those jeans. <laughs> I was going to say... I have a, I'm finally in a class action shoot, shoot with my brothers and sisters for genetic betrayal against my father. Uh, because um, let's just say this whole package uh, is defective. Yeah, yeah. Defective. Well, I would agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> so um, well, my, I'm, look, I'm looking my, what's for What's sad is that my mother, for the longest time, everyone thought she was my sister. Uh, and yeah. I'm loathing the day in which people think my grandmother's my sister. <laughs> Buckle up. We'll see what 2023 yeah, holds. That's right. So, yeah, speaking of New Year's, uh, we're upon one mm. now that we started Advent. You know what I was thinking about the other day? Actually, it was before Advent, but it's a perfect topic for Advent. And that is um, in prayer, how we ought to have a constant disposition of being oriented toward the eternal horizon. To put it in blunt terms, to be aware that just uh, as the world will come to an end one day, so too will our time in this world come to an end one day. Likely the latter before the former. So we'll take our breath, our last breath here, probably long before the, the end of the world. That said, it is completely appropriate and I would say important that to have woven into the fabric of your prayer life a contemplation mm-hmm. of crossing the the horizon mm-hmm. from this life into eternity. Mm-hmm. And without that horizon in view, we're, we're, there's something essential from the Christian prayer life that's missing. Yes. You know, I'll tell you, let me, let me kick it off. So years ago, when I was first ordained, I was called to one of my first communion calls as a priest uh, back in the, in the late 90s. And a man had just been diagnosed with a terminal condition. He was 93 years old. Mm. And when I spoke with him, he said to me that he was devastated by the news and he didn't see it coming. (laughs) Yeah, you get you get the humor, right? I I I don't know if I audibly said, but I'm I'm I kind of think I did. I think I said, where did you think this was headed? Yeah. You know, it was a, it was just shocking. I'm thinking, especially back then. Like now, 80 is the new 70. Mm-hmm. Uh, but back then, 70 was considered yeah. older. And 90, 92, 93 years old, I mean, 
you're on borrowed time. So the fact that this man wasn't contemplating the eternal horizon, especially at that age, yeah. no less is what we're saying, it should be at every age, um, is, is shocking. And quite honestly, not part of the Christian ex- spiritual exercises. In a way that it was always woven into them before. There was such a, um, a practice and a cult of what they called the memento mori, right? That you remember death. And to the point where, imagine it, when you're a child, like you were taught this, right? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before right. I wake. Can you imagine? I said that as a two-year-old. Mm-hmm. Like death was embedded into our old prayers. Mm-hmm. Um, and in large part, I suppose, not just because it's a Christian um, expectation and a hope to see God, but also death was much more prevalent. Um, and we have l- lived in an age that has allowed us to perceive and to believe and imagine that that this can be put off for a long time and perhaps even in our consciousness sort of indefinitely. I had the same experience when I was in the mountains. I was a pastor in Franklin, a uh, wonderful place in the mountains um, for six years. And and. It was the kind of place that had one telephone in 1950 because it was so protected by a horseshoe mm-hmm. of mountains. and There was just a road basically to get to Atlanta. And as a result of that, the mountains were very pristine. They hadn't been developed. And so when I was there, it became a bit of a hot spot for everyone that we called them halfbacks, right? You leave New York, you go to Florida, but you come halfway back in mm-hmm, the summertime, mm-hmm. um, which was great. And I get it. We, right. Our parish thrived with those sorts of persons that were there for the summer. Yeah, and it's cooler in the mountains. It's cooler in the mountains. And they were, they were great people that I had there uh, and got to know and to meet. But what was striking to me was that they would build these houses on tops of mountains and invariably... It would happen every year that someone would no longer be able to go up to their mountain home, which wasn't finished yet. Like they were building an entirely new life yeah. at the age of 70, 75. Mm-hmm. And a huge house to which maybe in their minds they thought the grandkids would come to or the great grandkids mm-hmm. whatever, which oftentimes doesn't happen. It's like grandparents usually have to go <laughs> to see to the where their lives are. Because yeah. it's so complicated, right? Um but they wanted that experience, and invariably I heard the statement upon the death of one of them, we were going to build a life together up here, and the same sort of thing. Where did you think this was going in 80, yeah. 85, yeah. Um, when your house finally gets finished? Yeah. Um, you wonder, I mean, for me, in the discernment of my vocation in my teens, or starting you know, in my late teens and the early 20s, uh, the question of... As I've mentioned, I think before, uh, you know, and then what? Mm-hmm. Always ranked very high mm-hmm. in my contemplating my major or what I was going to do in life, right? So, oh, I pick this major, and then what? Well, then I maybe go there, and then what? And then I do this, and then what? And so, for me, it was an inescapable conclusion that you're going to take your last breath. It was always on that horizon, maybe not on a daily basis, but relative to charting large arcs in your life. And I think most people do that. I would hope that they do that. But I think what I'm trying to say, and I think what you're trying to say, is that it shouldn't just be about, you know, contemplating your your mortality shouldn't just be about large arcs in life. A will, estate planning, uh, or large arcs, yeah. It really ought to be daily. Yeah. Uh, When you go to pray, uh, you are looking and peering into the horizon of uh, between this life and the next, you don't really know how close you are. Uh, it could be closer than it appears. It could be further out than it appears. Uh, we don't really quite have that perspective nailed. Uh, sometimes we're given indications by doctors about how far out it may be. But that horizon in view is the proper orientation for prayer. Yeah. Uh, because we are talking about entering the kingdom of God. Well, isn't that exactly what we pray for, that his kingdom would come. Yeah. Um, And yet I suppose if we took that sort of thing literally, we might be less inclined to pray it. In other words, if I thought that my praying it would assist in bringing it about, not just the kingdom that needs to reign inside of my own soul, or even something like the the church having greater... um, being a greater leaven and, and force in, in the world, the kingdom of the church, as it were, 
but actually for his kingdom to say, okay, this world is done, and all of the, the would-be reigners and those to whom I gave authority is over, um, and here's the kingdom. Right. You know, there's a, there's a passage in Dante, which is interesting in the Purgatorio, where the, there's an area of, of sort of anti-purgatory. Remember in Dante's purgatory, because Satan fell from the heavens and he bores this hole way down deep into the earth, and that pushes up a mountain on the other side. And so when you get through hell, you start to climb this mountain of purgatory, and you go through various stages of purgation. But before Dante and Virgil can even start up the mountain, there are, they encounter a number of different persons. And in one level... These persons are not allowed to start, and they're the kings, most of the kings that weren't hmm. saints. And the reason is because they did something good, which is they governed, and they needed to be, we've talked about this before in terms yeah. of giving themselves to the common good, but they put off um, they put off the kingdom. They tried to put off the kingdom of God insofar as their own souls, considering the horizon hmm. of their life and considering what they're going to, you know, how they're, how they're going to meet the king of kings. Um, with always that thought that, you know, when I finish this project, when I finish this battle, when I finish this um, road work or whatever the thing might be, then I will give my soul over to the things of God. It reminds me, um, uh, the, the flip side of that, the the right disposition mm. of Mother Teresa, a prayer that she was said to have made at night, something to the effect that if if when I wake tomorrow, I don't give you, if I don't surrender totally my hands to your work, I ask that you take my life during the night. Now, <laughs> yeah. So are you willing to make that prayer? I make the opposite one. I always say, me. if if tomorrow you see that I'm going to be more in the red than in the black, right? okay, then, then take give me, me. Right. But if I got any shot at getting more into the black, right. <laughs> let me live. <laughs> And it's, I mean, that... I, I Mine is mercenary. About, exactly. <laughs> but you think about someone praying. I mean, and someone like her, um, you know, I would imagine she would have had complete and total faith that God would hear her and grant her her prayer. But, you know, anyone with a measure of faith making that prayer with an ounce of sincerity I, could, would feel the sharpness of it. Mm. Uh, and that's actually putting the horizon of, of eternity into view, yes. saying that there is this greater reality to which I move, that this current life is uh, at its service. And that is something I think that we've lost sight of, you know, tremendously, so to be quite honest. Well, I, I, I think that something that's grown in me over the course of time is a, is, I don't remember if we've ever spoken about this, but a, a distaste for um, statements like a bucket list. Yeah. Simply because what it's suggestive of is that heaven is going to be very boring. It's like I get this in. I got to get this in. Yeah. I have to get stuff done that I really want to do before I'm sort of stuck gazing at God for all eternity, assuming that that's where I'm going to go. Um, and it does belie the fact that that we don't necessarily want to go. Which on one level we can understand, right? I mean, death wasn't supposed to happen to us. And so the dissolution of body and soul, like no one wants to go through that. No one says to themselves, unless they're massively depressed, right? No one says, I just want my body and soul to be separated. Well, that doesn't... <laughs> right. I'm quite at home in my body, thank you. Right. I suppose when I get really, really old and decrepit, like next month... I might be ready to um, let that I go. I might be ready to let that go. <laughs> I want to I shed my body, like molt, you know, molt it off. The problem is there isn't one to replace it. That's just it. And we're not supposed to be without our bodies. Um, but then the further the further reality that I, I consider is that one of the things about Advent that strikes me, and actually Benedict XVI, when I was in Rome, I was there. The, by the first Advent I was living in Rome, I went to First Vespers at St. Peter's, and he did it, and he gave a little reflection. I never forgot. It was so potent. He's that way. He is that way. He has the, the insightful piercing, illuminative lines that, mm -hmm. that stay with you. And he said very, a, simple, a very simple thing about Advent. He said that whenever you're waiting for something that you want to happen, it fills the interim, the interim time with a sort of pregnant fullness. Mm. 
So he, he it's sort of drawing on Our Lady there and her anticipation. her way of anticipation, but at that. What what it but changes your time? Yeah, it changes your duration. Um, because I'm uh, so, for example, let, let's just say Christmas. Uh, Christmas is now four weeks away uh, f- from this recording, and if we were to think to ourselves, "I'm going to see someone I've not seen in a long time that I long to be with," well, all the time in between becomes so full. Is pregnant with anticipation. Whereas people yeah. in this season have such a difficult time, oftentimes because they don't know what they're looking forward to. Christmas is four weeks away, but if they don't have something that they're looking forward to in Christmas, or if those hopes are misplaced or get become delusioned, um, then it ends up being a season of, of sadness. Because what we look forward to fills our time right now. Mm. It's true. Um, in fact, one of the, the best things about taking a trip is mm. the anticipation of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, looking forward to it, planning it. I mean, I realize there's a lot of tedium and, you know, considering of expenses and things of that nature. But that said, it brings a certain life. Yeah. The anticipation of the future. I mean, to be sure, we're constantly in motion. I mean, none of us are stopped. We're constantly in motion in, in the currents of time. So it stands to reason that they we're always looking ahead. But when we don't have a sense of where we're headed or a sense of anticipation, there is a certain loss. I mean, granted, we grew up in, you know, you know back in those 80s and 90s where the carpe diem, the seize the day mentality, mm. you know, to to focus only on the present. Okay. That said, not to the exclusion of contemplating eternity Mm -hmm. and the inevitabilities of time relative to your own mortality. Don't be so caught up in the present that you're not looking ahead to understand where we are going and uh, maybe precipitate a few questions that need to be uh, asked and answered in your life about eternity. Uh, yes. I think that the more we don't look toward that inevitability, the m- more we keep ourselves busy in the current moment, well, the worse we're, the worse we are. It's the perfect sign of a chadia, right? I mean, people oftentimes, unfortunately, hear about the seven deadly sins, and one of them is sloth, which people interpret like the sloth. Someone moves slowly, um, but the greater sign of a chadia or that spiritual sadness in the soul is is manifested by constant activity and quote unquote busyness. Hence my statement about being busy. I'm trying to make sure I don't get busy because I'm deathly afraid of being quiet or mm-hmm. I don't want to be with the Lord or take my prayer time or what have you um, and give myself over to higher things because I don't enjoy divine things anymore. I do enjoy them. But to, to enjoy them, you have to deliberately will to enjoy them. Like you have to do it. And right. then they become terribly enjoyable and wonderful. But that's, I guess that's the f- fundamental question is if, if I knew that, let's say, I hadn't seen you in um, a year and we were going to get together next week. Um, it's something to plan for. It's something interesting. It's something fun. And I think, gosh, it's going to be great. You know, catch up on things. And I, I'm looking forward to it. So it fills that time. Whereas if I thought about someone that I did not want to see, how kind I was, I was going to use you for that part, but I didn't, <laughs> um, that it fills the interim time either with an emptiness or even a possible dread. So to not think about our death is fundamentally, aside from the separation of body and soul, it's to not think that I'm actually going to see God face to face. And what happens in me when that happens, when I think about seeing him, do I want to? Do I long to? Do I do I find that to be uninteresting? Um, am I indifferent to it? Am I afraid of it? Um, or do I long for it? Because I think it's the measure ultimately of our own sanctity. And I I hate to say to some degree that one places their activities and their efforts and their labors in this life on such a high bar that it seems to have the effect in us of wanting to push him back. Mm-hmm. Let me get this. To, even if it's for him. Let me get this yeah. stuff done for you, and then I'll be really happy to be with you. <laughs> right. Because, I mean, the reality is... these are so important. <laughs> we have our own satisfactions with we do. those things. We do. And, you know, what you described there, all those questions that you talked about, or, or that you raised, um, about that longing or fear of not longing for enough, those divine things, that's the disposition of a prayer life. Yeah. 
You know, when you and I pray every day, yeah. those are the sorts of things that contextualize a prayer life. It's, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm here before you. Mm-hmm. There are times in which I fear that. Mm-hmm. There are times in which I, I'm drawn ever closer to it. There are times in which I sit and wonder. There are times... So all of those uh, the, all of those questions, those those fears and those hopes and those anticipations, they're all bundled together in this context of being oriented toward this eternal horizon. And to understand that when you approach God and you, uh, you prayerfully dispose yourself toward God, that you're actually taking this disposition. It's the right disposition for prayer. Because we are not here in an eternal moment. Yeah. Uh, but we are addressing God who is and toward which we move. Yeah. Um, and, and all of those things are, are sort of part and parcel. They're the, the part of the package of having a proper prayer life. I sometimes think that people pray, they think that pray, prayer is simply a matter of asking God to help either others or self. Yeah. Uh, when it really is about communion. Yeah. It's funny when St. Thomas talks about prayer, he'll, he makes, of course, as you might imagine, a lot of different distinctions. But he begins with that word that we use for prayer, which is sort of, it does have that notion of petition. Request. Or, or bidding mm-hmm. prayers, as the English say, right? You're requesting something. And it is a genuine form of prayer. And I think the reason we use that word for it is because it is what most people do and only what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, and not the enjoyment of of meditation, of of contemplation, of study, of the things that begin to feel or fuel the soul with 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 the soul's food, um, to consume truth himself. And um, I I remember when I first heard about praying like that, as opposed to that's when you go to school, you go to mass as a kid, right? right? You go to mass as a kid, and it, you see people do exactly the same thing they did. When they were kids, like we've been in the church a long time now, like we mm-hmm. have, we got fifty years being in the church. Mm-hmm. And if you ask any pastor what ninety percent of his parishioners do when they walk in, they will walk in, they get the holy wa- holy water, the bulletin, they genuflect, they go to their pew, they do an attempt to kneel down, you know, for whatever thirty seconds at most. They probably pray for someone. If there's a candle, they might light it, and they sit down and they wait for mass, and they read the bulletin. Right. Right, that's not cutting it. <laughs> right, that's not right. a prayer life. <laughs> that mean, is not the sum of a prayer life, and it doesn't get you to or that point. Be. Where I mean, imagine someone like Saint Teresa of Lisieux or Aloysius Gonzaga, both of whom died in their youth, and both of whom knew that they were going to die. Like when when Saint Therese coughs up blood, she saw that as a divine invitation, mm. and she was rejoicing in it. She knew she was going to die. I'm talking about a young woman whose life is way ahead of her. Right? She's not. She's not, she's not 85 or 95 or whatever right. else saying, I can't believe this has happened. I'm devastated. <laughs> She's like, this is perfect. Yeah. He's coming to get me. What her prayer was like, I don't know, but I need some of it. Yeah. Um, and a lot of wishes because Naga was the same. Or, so they yeah. longed for it. Absolutely. Now I need to kind of redeem one concept and that is the bucket list. Okay. Because I would say that there is something relatable to it mm. in the sense that there are things we want to do. Yeah. Right? I'd like to see the Aurora Borealis. I think that would be really fascinating. I, I tend to find that I want to do things as I get older that are more nature-based. Mm. You know, like certain like waterfalls and, yeah. you know, Aurora Borealis and that sort of thing. A little less man-made-ish. But um, all that being said... I do desire, as I'm sure other people out there are, are desire, to do certain things. I would love to do certain things. But that's not the same as, as you say, um, this this list I have to get done because I'm about to cease to exist. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good <laughs> point. And I think maybe to make one more distinction with it, um, to see, let's just say, the Arroyo Borealis or the Niagara Falls or whatever, um, and to recognize intellectually that whatever good that is, that exists perfectly in him. I was like, I'm not going to lose out on that. Exactly. You're going to get more um, of get it. Get more of it. Yeah. But, but maybe another way to even rehabilitate the bucket list is 
those things which I want to do for him. In other words, I've only got one life to spend on him that actually does um, create this wild thing we call merit. That even though it's it's preceded by God's power, it's sustained by his power, it's preceded by his grace, it's sustained and perfected by his grace. Nevertheless, if I do these things in, with, and for him, he's actually going to say to me, even though I basically did nothing, um, well done, good and faithful mm. servant, which we want to hear. Right. So I think part of my anxiety over that or, or, or feverishness about feeling that I got to do something more, I, I'm hoping that it's motivated, frankly, by a desire to say, I only got one chance at this, and I don't. You I don't invested want, your coin. I don't wisely. want to. Sit, I want. To, I want to invest all but, my yeah. talents. You know. Yeah, yeah, I, I, without um, doubt. And that's that's probably a positive way to see the bucket list too. Yeah, exactly. I I think so. But you know, when you look around, and one of the things that I think we try to do is take a look around at the world with the eyes of faith. Mm. Um, I wonder how much of the secular trends that we experience in Western society in the world in which we live is a result of people taking their eye off the ball in terms of mortality yeah. and contemplating those bigger things. I mean, the Baltimore Catechism, I mean, obviously that was just a catechism in the 1800s for here in the U.S., but it was succinct and kind of got right to the point. Yeah. Uh, who made me? Why was I made? I mean, those are the big horizon questions. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and unless you get those down, unless you have them cemented in your mind <laughs> and in your soul and in your daily life, everything else is going to be off kilter. It's off. Everything. And you're going to end up disoriented. That is facing another direction other than the proper one, which is that eternal horizon. Amen. And that disorientation is disorienting in every facet of life. Yeah. It is disorienting and it's going to have its effects in every facet of life, and is it all going to be slightly off? Yeah, I think in some sense we've tried to be too complicated in our teaching of the children. And yeah. when what they really need is to make sure that those basics are so ingrained in them that when they, when they fall, I mean, when any of us fall, we, we fall to the degree of our training, right? Like you, you kind of, mm-hmm. you, if life is difficult, and it will be, and it is, you sort of, as you go down in suffering on some level, you, you land on your training. And uh, how many times have you been with persons that were of a different age that have died that are you know, 80, 90 years old, 70 years old, that had those things? Right. And they still respond to the same truths that they know. Mm-hmm. I was made by God to know, love, and serve Him. I was made to be happy with Him in this life and the next. And, and, and I must do something to respond to the gift that He's given to me. Like, they just got that ingrained. Whereas if you ask the kids, oftentimes in the last you know, 40, 50 years, probably in the education that you and I would have received, um, why did God, who is God? Why did He make me? What answer would you have given? Yeah. Well, you know, I was reading uh, Ratzinger years ago. Uh, I think it was Into Christianity. And... He talked about understanding as the, the ground on which you stand. Mm-hmm. And it mm-hmm. being that foundational, that mm-hmm. you, it is the ground on which you are established or in which you stand, it, the effect of understanding, mm-hmm. um, which was really interesting. I never really. Nicely in English. Yes, it, it does. It kind of works that well. Well, I way. suppose Verstehen is the same. Yeah. In German. Yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah. Well, in in that sense, uh, if we've lost the ground on which we stand because we've stopped asking the questions that actually answer those that are meant to shore up the ground in which we stand and orient ourselves properly, then literally every endeavor in life is going to be off. Well, that said, we're running up against our time here. So before... (laughs) Apropos of our discussion. (laughs) Exactly. Before we And we're exiting November, which was the month that we remember the dead. Yes. That was very appropriate. That's true. And, and approaching into Advent. The season of Advent. Yeah. In which so we're, we're, in, we're in Advent. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Excellent. That, you're welcome. I have to say before we go. Yes. Everyone every year tells me what, how to do a turkey. <laughs> and I'm all about the turkey. Mm-hmm. I really am. I want the turkey. I want the stuffing. I want the potatoes. I make it every year. Yes. And every year I change something based upon what someone has told me. And every year, it's the same turkey. 
I don't care if she's been brined for mm-hmm. 50 days, if she's been turned over, mm-hmm. fried, smoked, boiled, whatever. Or stuffed with a duck. Or stuffed with a duck. <laughs> um, and I, I love it. I mean, I'm, I'm a big turkey fan. Yeah. It always comes out wonderful. It's juicy. It's great. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I don't notice massive incremental differences or massive or incremental differences in what I'm doing. Certainly, you could overdo a turkey and it's dry right. and nasty. But I got to say, um, next year, I'm just going to put the blinders on. I'm going to put mm. the blinkers on, the blinders on and say, I'm not changing anything. I'm doing this for the rest of my life this way. Because it only happens once a year. I don't get bored with it. No. <laughs> so. <laughs> so it's just a regular roast. Yeah. So I, for, for both of those listeners out there, don't send me any options about turkeys. I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> that to me is an invitation to give you all sorts of <laughs> <laughs> recommendations. All right. Well, since you're on the uh, the, the post Thanksgiving uh, um, reflection, I would simply say, hands down, my favorite side are yams. Those sweet yams. I have no comment. I've never eaten a yam. What? No. You've never had that at Thanksgiving? I mean, is a yam the same as a sweet potato? Basically. They're... Okay, because I've had sweet potatoes. Okay, but, but not like mashed, like a mashed potato. They're cut and they're like drenched in butter. maple syrupy butter. butter. Very and sweet. Butter. Sometimes they have marshmallows. No. Oh, yeah. You don't put marshmallows on savory food. That's ridiculous. It's a sweet food, hence sweet potato. Or it's still a, yam. a potato. No, 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 no. You don't understand. And that side... That burst of sweetness. And this is for you. With all the other savory, this is for you. Is just it's un, it's unrivaled. Among okay. the sides, you have to have the sweet yam or. Sweet I do potato. the pumpkin pie. I'm all about the pumpkin pie. That's disgusting. Pumpkin is a vile food. <laughs> I don't like the smell. I don't like those. Can't I can't stand it. We'll go back over this next pumpkin Thanksgiving. Pumpkin flavors and coffee. <laughs> pumpkin spice. Pumpkin sweet spice. It's a all gourd. Autumn spice. People, animals eat well, pumpkins. You, just, you got a potato. Come on. You're talking about potatoes. Yeah, but those you, are... you have a prejudice against a gourd yeah. when you're eating potatoes? No, that was God meant for potatoes to be. I mean, entire populations lived and died on potatoes. And a gourd. I mean, it's a pumpkin. That's all I'm saying. And it doesn't smell good either. Have a great week. You too. <laughs> bye bye. Ciao. Makes me wanna scream from the rooftop to the screen. Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests, and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners. Sign up at rooftoppodcast.com. And remember, for more great ways to deepen your faith, check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com. And we'll see you again next time from the rooftop. Anywhere.